All right, well, let's slowly say a, a word of prayer and that God will settle our hearts and try to keep us focused and, uh, and then take the time to get into his word. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do come before you this day and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but your words won't pass away. It's forever settled in heaven. Uh, your word is good. It's true from the beginning, and we're so thankful for it. We can't thank you enough for your word. It's powerful, uh, Lord God. It, 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 it's effective, especially, uh, Lord, when we believe it in our own lives, propagate it. And I pray today that your people be encouraged, uh, Lord, to understand that there is no faith outside of your word. There is no faith outside of Christ. True faith, genuine faith, great faith is demonstrated in believing in you and your ways, your word, your will. And I ask and pray that you'd edge this truth in our hearts this morning, that we'd be built up in the faith and live by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. And through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently what? Seek him. The Hebrews 11 chapter has been called the hall of faith. It is commonly known as the faith chapter. This letter was written to Hebrew believers who for the most part were still holding on to some of the old covenant practices. And from Hebrews chapter one to chapter 10, the Hebrew writer labels on the fact that Jesus is superior to the old covenant. The old covenant points to Jesus who is the beginning of the new covenant, noting the fact that Jesus is the better way. And uh, this new covenant is found no doubt in the blood of Jesus Christ, who is a better sacrifice, and that the new covenant can only be entered in by faith in Jesus Christ. And so the Hebrew writer directs the attention of these Jewish believers to the Old Testament saints to demonstrate that the just shall live by faith. The statement is found several times in the epistles and one time in the book of Hebrews in chapter number 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now having concluded chapter 10 as a theological standpoint and indeed a biblical truth that the just shall live by faith, the Hebrew writer proceeds with chapter 11 from a practical standpoint. He says uh, in verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, we find in verse 1 a description of faith more than a definition of faith. Faith means to trust or to believe, but verse 1 describes it as faith in action. It is uh, how faith works, it's how faith operates. He says this, faith is the substance, which is uh, the setting under, it is foundational, it is the structure of things hoped for. Our faith is the very thing that we stand upon for the things we hope or expect to happen or come to pass based upon the Word of God. Faith is the assurance that we have and the hope that we have in God's Word that what He said will happen will happen. Note the word hope. It's often used as an expression of and the, you know things that we hope to see happen like in a sense I hope so-and-so comes today but the biblical hope and that the hope that we have according to God's Word is an expectation that will happen it's a full assurance it's based upon God and his word and his promises of what he purposed to do faith is the full confidence and expectation that when <clears throat> what we believe about the things of God from the beginning to the end in reality will come to pass uh, Hebrews 1 says, now faith is the evidence of things not seen. And so the evidence of things not seen relates to the things of God, the eternal things. Uh, of course, his existence 
and the way he fashioned the world, uh, the eternal kingdom of God and every single detail that accompanies, accompanies uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, Christ himself, who is uh, the hope of glory, uh, heaven, hell, and uh, those things, uh, the evidence of not seeing. Faith, which is our foundation, is the confidence in the conviction of what we cannot see with our own eyes based upon the promise of God or the Word of God. We believe God, although we cannot see Him, because we see the evidence of His handiwork for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power uh, and glory and God. Why? So that they are without excuse. You know, creation itself points to a creator God, like any building points to a builder, like any painting points, points to a painter. God, the creator, his creation points to his handiwork. We believe God is holy because not only uh, his handiwork, but the, the, the law of God and our God-given conscious conscience, which he has put the law of God in our heart, rings like a bell when we do things wrong. That's, that just points to the fact that we have a holy God who, has a holy law, who is a holy lawgiver. Faith is not blind. In other words, uh, it's based on facts. It's based on the word of God. Without God's word, there could be no true faith. Uh, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. And true faith is taking God at his word. It is obeying his voice of thus saith the Lord. Warren Reesby said, true Bible faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of our circumstances and consequences. I would like to use an example of a man who demonstrated great faith. Turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 7. And he wasn't a Jew, he was actually a Gentile. And Jesus uses him to point out, if you will, uh, how faith is, looks like or demonstrated. I want you to see in he, uh, Luke chapter 7. And have a look at verse 1 of Luke 7. Now when he, Jesus, had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he have built, have built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, I'm not worthy. Thou shouldest enter under my roof. He says, Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But he said, Say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man under authority, set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to one, Go, and he goeth, and one unto another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard these things, he what? He marveled. He marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Not in Israel. Now during the, the, this time, the Lord Jesus was no doubt performing miracles. He was sharing messages and his fame would have uh, spread abroad so much so that the centurion got wind of it and uh, heard that he was coming his way and, uh, and called his uh, Jews or the elders of the Jews to go seek Jesus that he may come and heal his sick servant. Uh, he, he was you know, ready to die. He was at the point of death. And uh, in, in verse 2 says that very clearly that he, he was dear unto him. Uh, he, was, uh, he was sick and ready to die. Now, let me just say uh, just a bit of background about a centurion. A centurion was a, uh, a, a Roman official that was a soldier that was in charge of uh, about 100 soldiers under him. He was working for the Roman government. He was prominent in position. He was prominent in power. Uh, he perhaps was pagan by birth, hence him being a Gentile. He would have been wealthy as he had a servant and uh, also had connections with the Jewish people. 
And he held the Jewish people in high regard and, and built them, if you will, a synagogue, helped build this synagogue. So the centurion sends not only the Jews, but the elders of the Jews to Jesus to intercede on his behalf so he could come and heal his sick servant. Now, I would say that he did this because, again, he, he didn't feel that he was worthy. He didn't feel like Jesus would, he perhaps any kind of Jew, but the elders of the Jew, uh, to, to intercede on his behalf because he was a Gentile. Uh, he perhaps was thinking that he'd get a better chance at his request uh, with the elders and they perhaps convince him to come as him being an uncircumcised Gentile. And, uh, and notice verse 4 and 5, when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation and hath built us a synagogue. Now I don't know if perhaps he wanted them to go and kind of beg in such a way that they were... Uh, you know, making him proud and uh, worthy and so forth. Uh, you know, he was an ordinary uh, uh, Gentile in his own eyes, but they thought, mate, this Gentile is, is for us. You know, he's worthy. You don't understand. He, 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 if anybody deserves, uh, you know, uh, this, it, it's him. It's this Gentile. And so although the Jews thought him to be worthy, he himself did not think to be worthy in any way at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, this would play a significant part in demonstrating of what a great faith looks like. And that's what we want to look at today. W what is a great faith? I mean, uh, it made Jesus marvel. Two people in the Bible who made Jesus marvel was this man regarding their faith in him, and it was that widowed woman. But we're going to look at this person today. We won't look at the widowed woman, but, uh, you know considering himself to not be worthy and not even approach Jesus and, not, and say to Jesus, I'm not even worthy to come to you or you even been come into my house, come under my roof. I'm not worthy of that, displays a humility that is a reflection of his faith of who he was dealing with. And so, first of all, what is the demonstration of a great faith? It's, it, it, it accompanies humility. All right, verse 6 to 7. Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof, neither for, he says, for uh, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. So genuine faith has an attitude of humility. When a person sees their unworthiness, listen, it is a reflection of who he is in the light of who is before him. Who, who is he? I'm a sinner. Yeah, I am a Gentile, but I'm a, I'm a sinner. Who's before you? The Lord. The ho uh, I mean, we're, listen, uh, he Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he's what? That he is. And he believed, and we'll see it later on in Matthew chapter 8, it's a contrast of this passage, he called him Lord. He believed the Lord, God manifested in the flesh, and he, you know, a remarkable a Gentile, to say the least, knowing Gentiles knew. See, you understand that Gentiles, uh, some of the Gentiles knew uh, the things of the Messiah because they were on the outskirts looking in to what the promises were given to Israel, and they, some of them would have desired them. Some of them would have uh, wanted to be a partaker of those by faith. And there's no doubt that this uh, you know, centurion had this uh, knowledge of who was before him, and it was a reflection of who I am to say, I'm not worthy. In the light of who I am and who he is, he saw it. Well, Peter saw it. Remember when Peter finally saw Christ who was before him and he said he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O what? O Lord. Uh, what about Paul when he saw it? He actually said to Timothy, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am what? Chief. And the prodigal son, when he came to the end of himself, he saw it. And he said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and no more worthy to be called thy what? Son. 
What about John the Baptist? He saw it. In verse uh, 16 of Luke 3, uh, he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchets of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. You know what he was saying, John? John was simply saying this, I'm not even worthy to be your servant. Because that's what servants did. They, they came and uh, they, they uh, you know, un, under, undo the sandals and they wash the feet. And he says, I'm not even worthy to do that. You see, you, what you have to understand, I am not worthy, has an undeserving element to it. I'm not, I don't deserve this. This is a high calling. This is, this is way beyond me. Uh, I mean, this Gentile official, Roman official, understood his unworthy state knowing he was in the presence of the Lord. And that's what happens. Well, well that's what should happen. Amen. I mean, in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Look at this, Lord. Lord. Now, I understand that many. Uh, like that rich man would come to him and say, Lord, and other people would come to him and say, Master, or Rabbi, and so forth. But this is a demonstration of, of what was taking place. He didn't just say this with his lips. You can actually see this account. And, and not only that, but Jesus attributing to him great faith that this man really had him at length as his Lord. It leads us to the next point. What is the great uh, demonstration of a great faith? Well, it has a humble disposition but it also has a complete respect and reverence for God or for the Lord and a dependence upon him. Have a look at verse 7. In other words, he did recognize the lordship of Christ. Verse 7, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but look at this, but say in a word, say in a word and my servant shall be healed. You know, genuine faith must be wholly dependent upon Christ and his word. And this centurion knew the powerful word of God. I've heard it said and put like this, and I very much appreciate this statement. It says, faith begins with believing in God's person, that he is who he says he is, and faith ends with believing in God's promises, that he will do what he says he will do. And if we would believe just like this man, if we would know and understand that God's word is preeminent and it's powerful and what he, uh, and what he says uh, will happen, will happen and there's power in the word of God, then there's no doubt our faith would be made manifest. The centurion understood the authority that came with it. It wasn't these magical words or whatever. There was authority behind the words. Hence being Lord. And he knew that authority. Why? Because he was a man of authority. He knew and understood that he, his word had authority, had, it, it, it had strength behind it. It wasn't just dead, it, it, there was power in his command because of the authority that he had. Okay, and he says this in verse uh, 7, but just say a word and my servant shall be healed. Verse 8, for I also a man sent under what? Authority. authority. Having under me soldiers. I, I, I'm a man of authority, I know how this works. I tell one go and he goes. I tell one come and he comes. I tell one do this and he doesn't. I know how it is when it comes down to authority. I'm a man under authority. There are people under me. But over here he acknowledges the authority of all authorities. I mean, uh, we're not dealing with... We, we, he, he, Jesus has the power to command uh, diseases. To, to, you know, what we see today, what in the medical industry and, and the, the pharmaceutical, uh, pharma, pharmacy uh, industry of what we see and, and, and what we, you know, these people thrive and that God could just, just by a word, get rid of all that if he wanted to. And I believe that when he did those miracles, because he could just do them today if he wanted, I believe it was setting an example to show us how powerful God's word is but more than just for the physical element of life, but more for the spiritual element. People are wrapped up so much so in the physical elements, but Jesus came and did those miracles so he would un people will understand that he has power over creation, power over demons, power over the devils, and listen, he has power over sin and death. It's greater than just the physical, the here and now. When Jesus did miracles, it's so that people that would believe on him, John said that very clearly, and believe on the gospel, and believe on his words. 
So he, 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 he believed in the lordship of Christ and the power of his word. He believed that he is. And God is absolutely pleased with those that, you know, utterly believe, fully believe, wholly believe in him and in his word. He says, without it, you cannot please God. Why? Because when you come to him and you believe that he is, you believe that he's God and his Lord and his word is above all, that he magnifies his word even above his name. You're believing in his integrity. You're believing in his character. You're believing in his wisdom, his righteous judgment and what God says he will do. And, and you trust that. There's no reason to doubt it. And he believed it. Faith gives God his proper place in our lives. It's not this, uh, you know, faith that we see today in Christendom, name it and claim it, and you have the power by your faith to command. No. It's to give God the proper place in our lives to know that he is Lord. And what he says and what he wills to be done will be done. Faith that pleases God is a faith that believes that God, ta uh, that, that we, we take God at his word. And believing that God exists is a good start, but it's not enough. James says, thou believest that there's one God that doest well. The devils also believe in what? Tremble. The devils are doing better than your average atheist today. But believing in God and following after him is a must. He that uh, diligently seeks him uh, must come to him. Faith comes to him. It recognizes who he is. And it comes to him. And there's no doubt this centurion beseeching him came to him knowing him. Now sadly, we live in a day where our modern day Christianity undermines the lordship of Christ. It really does. And I'm talking about modern day Christianity. It's terrible. I believe this is the case of the high rise of having unruly uh, professing Christians, uh, and false brethren, false teachers, uh, is because of that very reason that they've uh, come in and crept into the church undermining the character of God. I want you to turn to Jude chapter 1 and I want you to see it in verses 3 and 4. I mean, this Gentile centurion, in a sense, not only puts the Jewish nation to shame, but also puts some professing Christians to shame today. In verses 3 to 4, Jude says to Christians, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, he said it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, who are they? Men that turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as Jude writes this sharp book, this letter to Christians, he doesn't waste any time marking out the creeps who act in the name of Christianity, but are rebels in heart. He gets to it. And he knows that there's a need for it, not only 2,000 years ago, but he knew perhaps there's a need for it even today, that these men not only distraw, distort the character and the grace of God, his love, but also they distort and deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, these people that come in and it's almost teach that you have a license to, to sin, that grace gives you that license. And, and you know what, let me say, they go hand in hand. Because, you know, this grace that God has expressed or given through his son teaches us to deny all what? Ungodliness and worldly lust and that we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this world, in this present world. You know, the grace and the love of God doesn't cause us to rebel and run from God. It causes us to run to God, making our Lord. Saying, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Whatever you want, I'll do. Wherever you, uh, whatever you say, I, I know it's true. I will obey. Though it's hard at times. We don't understand that. But we don't, we don't rebel against it. We come under it. 
But these men rejected these people that come into the in Christendom as a whole, not only into local churches, but as a whole through YouTube and other places, and you watch and you listen to their teaching, they're rebels on stage, they, and they act like one, and they, and they have a following, and they kind of, you know, in an indirect way, cause people to rebel from the authority of God's word and for the very things that God teaches us. They twist the scriptures. And when you reject the authority of the Lord, you deny his word. These men not only undermine the holiness of God, but also undermine the authority. They creep in. Jude calls them ungodly men. You know what ungodly means? Means that people that are against God. Not everyone that carries a Bible is a godly man. He looks godly, but he's not. He's a creep. Some of them are creeps that creep in, that, that, that they say one thing, but act another. Denying the Lordship of Christ is to deny their origin. It's to deny their creator. Uh, these men carry the same symptoms of the fallen angels. Look at verse 6. And the angels which, crept, uh, which kept not their first what? Estate. They kept not their first estate, but left their own inhabitation. You know, the, you know, God created these angels. God created these men. And instead of being under the lordship of God, uh, they rebel against him. And so these men are just the same. These men will undermine the deity of Christ. It says he, the only Lord God, refers to our Lord Jesus. Jude uses the, the, the word Lord five times in this letter. And look at verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew it, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Who were them that uh, believed not in the wilderness? Well, it was those people that rebelled against God in the wilderness, listen, and murmured against him. Uh, they were the unbelievers, they were the mixed multitudes, if you will, that came out of Egypt around the remnant, and they were just simply re rebels against God. They tempted Christ and murmured against him. And as a matter of fact, Paul says to the Corinthians, don't be like that. Don't rebel against the Lordship of uh, Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of what? Serpents. Not only this, but the Lord is also used in verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring it against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now Michael, the archangel, used uh, the strong and powerful name of the Lord to rebuke the devil. He fought against the devil in heaven with the power of Christ, but he used the name of the Lord. Because there is power and authority in the name of the Lord. And Michael, even the archangel, knew that. In verse 14, Enoch predicted and prophesied the coming of the Lord. And who's coming again? Jesus Christ. He's, he's going to return and execute righteous judgment. Look at verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Verse 17, Jude reminds the believers of the Lordship of Christ over the apostles. He says, true, you know, the true apostles of, of Christ, not these false teachers, they submit to the Lord. In verse 17, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The apostles, the true apostles, not the false apostles, were under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In verse 21, Jude encourages the believers to remain in God's love by looking to, to the Lord's return. He says, keep yourself in the love of God. Verse 21, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto what? Eternal life. These creeps masquerading under the Christian banner are rebels. It's sad to see Christendom the way it is today, don't have any respect to any authority. The Lordship of Christ should be the supreme authority in the life of the believer, and it trickles down. Uh, the word Lord appears about 6,000 to 6,000 times in the Old Testament. It appears about 650 to 720 times in the New Testament. Catholic leaders today undermine the Lordship of Christ by teaching other mediators. Uh, charismatic leaders undermine the lordships of Christ by emphasizing the Holy Spirit. Uh, the SDA, SDA leaders undermine the lordship of Christ that emphasize the Sabbath over the Lord of the Sabbath. 
JWs and Muslims are the same. They undermine the Lordship of Christ. And they make him just to be a, a, a son or a good man or just one of the prophets. No, he's the, he's the Christ. He's God manifested in the flesh. He's the Lord of glory. And God has given him a name above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. We must learn to bow to the Lordship of Christ now. These men do not in any way have a heart to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 6 verse 46, he says, Why call me Lord, Lord, look at this, and do not the things which I say. Now I want you to see the response to the centurion's attitude. Go back to Luke chapter 7 and look at verse 9. Look at the response. Luke chapter 7, look at verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, <laughs> he marveled. He marveled. Uh, the most, I, th I believe, the most amazing thing in this encounter is the reaction of the Lord to this centurion. Cause him to marvel. You know, what, what, what it means to be in amazement, to be in wonder, like, I can't. Wow, what an attitude, what a disposition to have. Instead of having a, oh, I'm worthy, he's worthy, we're all worthy. No, we're not worthy. Hey, listen, brethren, we're not even worthy to be alive. Who are we, the psalmist said in Psalm 8, who are we? Who are we that God will visit us that made the stars and the moon? Who are we? I mean, the psalmist was blown away that God would have even an interest in man. Who are we? We're not worthy. We're not even worthy of eternal life. We're not worthy of anything. And yet you have people and professing Christians living like as if they're worthy. But not only this, he was amazed at the fact that he knew and understood the power in God's word and the authority that came behind it. And he submitted himself under it. He was dependent. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. Remember, this centurion had the attitude of John the Baptist. There's no doubt. I'm not even worthy to unbuckle his shoelace, so to speak. I'm not even worthy to be a servant. I'm not even worthy to come to you. I'm not even worthy that you'd come to me. I'm not just say a word and it'll be done. There was a holy reverence. There was a faith that understood who was before him and what his word meant. Now, let me just say, how much faith in God and his word do we need? Because this great faith, all of a sudden our mind will, will simply go to, and he had this big faith, you know, this great faith. And we, we kind of think, how do we have this real great faith? But it, it, it really, it it's not in a mass. You know, Luke chapter 17, verse 5, the apostle said unto him, Lord, increase our faith. And, 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 and Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of what? Mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamore tree, be plucked out by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should, be, and it should obey you. And in Matthew chapter 17, oh, right, we'll have a look at the mustard seed there. We'll see, have a look at the, this how big, how big should our faith be in Christ? Look how big. Because it's, listen, it's not about us. It's the subject of the faith, uh, our faith. It's not even about our faith. It's not even, a, you know, in a sense that it's, a, oh, look how great I am. No. It, it's, it's an attitude and a disposition of who he is and believing who he is and trusting who he is, and listen, and it's a reflection on how I behave. I behave in such a way when I put this little faith in him. Look, you either have faith or you don't. You either have it or you don't. You either believe that he is or you don't. You believe his word or you don't. It's not about how great faith in, in mass. No, Jesus said if you just have this little faith, 
It's trying to have this like this hyperbole. That's a, all you've got to do is believe in me, believe, believe. How? Like this centurion. Look at this attitude, see? In Matthew chapter 17, he said this, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and you say to the mountain, uh, unto this mountain, uh, remove hence from yonder, and it should be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. You know, why couldn't we do this, Lord? Why couldn't we do that? Because of your unbelief. You either have faith or you don't. You, and so faith demonstrated is knowing who he is and knowing who you are in the light of who he is and obeying him and knowing and understand that his word is able to do what he said it will do. You know why a lot of people doubt their salvation? Because they don't believe in the promises of God. They don't believe that God uh, you know, would say what he said will happen, will happen. You either have faith in Christ or you don't. You either trust his word or you don't. Jesus was amazed at the fact that this centurion was not great in himself, but rather marveled at the fact that he just believed in God or the Lord and his word. He believed it. There was no doubt. He never came to him half-heartedly or doubting. Someone said one day to a missionary called Hudson, Hudson Taylor, what great faith you have. And he replied, God is not looking for a great faith, but faith in a great God. Don't misunderstand Jesus and what he was saying. He was just showing, look. Look at this faith, how he believes in me and my word. Look how it, it, it's demonstrated and look how it behaves itself. It's a faith that pleases God. It's an attitude of our hearts and minds according to what we have in, uh, before us and, and what we see, the handiwork of God. That's where it begins, the, creation, the light of creation and the light of conscience and the light of Christ and his word. I mean, listen, you can't end up accepting Christ and his word if you reject your conscience uh, by, by rejecting the law or the moral law of God and his holiness. And you sure cannot get there if you reject the creator altogether. What makes great faith is what we believe or what we trust or depend upon, what we reverence and respect what we value, what we see in, in, in before us. Just this much, brethren. If you would just believe God and his word and you take it, if you would believe this Bible to be God's word, because it's a reflection on how you behave. I run to God. I say, God, whatever your word says it, that settles it. I'm under it. I don't question it. I might have some questions in relation to it, but I don't question it. I believe it. And today you have scribes or wannabes that always undermine this book very subtly from the pulpit. I believe every word in this book. I believe God is able to preserve every word. I have every word. If we don't have it, then we're all men most miserable. God is not that powerful. God is not able to say what he said he will do. He, no, he, 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 I believe he is. And I take it by faith and I know that if he said no man lives on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, I've got to have every word. I've got to have it. <laughs> Give me it. I've got to find it. I've got to have it. Give me it. Where is it? And that's why the modern versions undermine the Word of God. I, knew, I, I learned that a few years after I got saved. As a matter of fact, there was a guy that, he, he bought himself a Bible and there was some verse missing. And we showed him, or, or, or some people showed him, and said, look, brother, there's some verse missing from this one. And he thought it was a misprint. So he went back with all sincerity and says, you've got to give me another Bible. This one's not good. And I said, oh, well, they're all like that. It's a modern version. They've taken verses out. There's an attack on the Word of God today, I tell you. There's an attack on the Word of God. If, if Satan attacked the Word of God in the beginning, don't you think he's doing it today? Absolutely. Why? Because if, if he undermines the Word of God, causes doubt, then w w where's your faith going to be? You have no faith outside of the Word of God. You surely have no faith outside of Christ. How much do you need? This much. This much. 
when I talk about the mustard seed, I usually, I usually uh, carry some with me so I could give it to you. So you could, any time you try, the devil tries to get you to doubt God's word, you could just, you can just kind of remember how much faith he wants you to have in it. It's this much. That's all it takes for God to do a, a work in your life. This, this much. Because you either have it or you don't. Just this much. Look, at, look how much. You can't even see it in this bag, can you? Because it's not about us. It's about him, although we have a responsibility to believe, don't we? We do. Every single one of us has a responsibility to believe on him. But how much of that faith is he looking for? This much. With what kind of attitude? Like the centurion. Don't forget the centurion's attitude because Jesus marveled at it. Faith is not, I'm going to do a great work for God and look at all these works. Well, what kind of attitude do you have in doing that? Look how many people are led to Christ. You led. Oh. Is that how, is that how we measure faith? Well, I don't, I don't think Stephen did well, did he? If we measure faith by our, our, our fruit... No, it's character. It's never by results. It's never been about results. Did I give you one? Yeah. I want you to just look at the size of that and see. It's a good reminder because you know what? The devil's trying so hard today to cause you to doubt God's word. I'm telling you, 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 you doubt God's word, you're done. And if you doubt, you're damned. If, if faith pleases God, then unbelief displeases God. You agree with that? And then unbelief comes in a proud manner, in a rebellious manner. Faith comes humble. And just, that's why Jesus said, if you don't come like this little child, dependent, there's no way that you're going to enter into heaven. And brethren, when you come to Christ in that humble disposition, that continues, or that should continue, no matter how much work God has done in your life or is doing in your life or using you, you stay low. You stay humble. I'm still not worthy. 20 years, I've, I, you know what? I'm growing to see more of my unworthiness because I'm growing to see more of who he is. Because I want you to see as we close in verse 10 and, and he says this and they that, went, uh, that were sent returning to the house found the servant what? Whole. And if you, if you see Matthew he actually says I'm going, I'm going I'll go we have a God that's come all the way from heaven and made himself of no reputation I mean, he would probably be blown away of how easy he said, yeah, I'll go. Uh, Jesus said, yeah, I'll go. God is not against you. God is for you. That's what faith believes also. That this God is allowing sinners like us to approach him. To touch him, to request, to call on him, to worship him, to follow him, to be a servant of him, friend, child of God. So when you learn all these things after you're saved, you realize how much more you're unworthy of those titles. The worst thing that can ever, ever happen to a believer's faith is when they fall into pride. And they don't see him like they used to. He came down, made himself of no reputation, took upon him a form of a servant, became in the likeness of men humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I mean, if anybody exhibited or demonstrated humility under the authority of God the Father, listen, it was Jesus Christ. You can't get greater than that. He always did what the Father told him to do. And he found joy 
in doing it. You know, people today, they have joy in rebelling against God. They love it. They, 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 they thrive at it. They become em- enemies. And God forbid that any one of us in this room will follow the pattern of the world and even professing believers that twist or distort the grace of God and his lordship in our life. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus associates his faith to that which can be saving faith. I want you to see in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10, as we, as we begin to close, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and he said to them that followed, Very, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in, all, uh, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But look at this. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into where? Out of darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of what? Wow. You see, what, what, what's he saying? He said, well, not all Israel, the chosen people of God, or the children of the kingdom were having a disposition like this centurion. They rebelled against God. They thought they were the best thing that ever happened. We are from Abraham. Oh, we are Abraham descendants. I'm, I'm, stuck. I'm from Benjamin. I'm from Judah. I'm from Levi. And they prided themselves. They didn't understand that when God chose them, it was because of the love of God that he would choose them. And it should be a reaction to say, you would choose me and believe to follow you. They thought they were the best thing compared to the Gentiles that ever happened to this earth. And you know what, Christians, we need to be very careful that we don't look down at the, at, at the sinner out there that once we sat in their shoes and have grace upon their life in reaching them. You don't know who's a non-believer. You don't know who will reject. You don't know who's the hog and dog until you simply go and continue to love on people and show them the way to salvation. You just don't know. You think that centurion will ever get saved? A Roman official? I mean, look at the authority that he has and look at the people under him. And just, No, look at his disposition. Look at Paul, chief of sinner, by his own testimony. And then he said in verse 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast what? Personal faith. He believed. It wasn't like God gave him the faith to believe, to, and then, you know, what great... No, he believed. You believed. You had this disposition. Faith is not a work. Paul reconciles that with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. The gift of God is eternal life. Uh, It's salvation. By grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. Through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by faith. In God's grace. Faith is not a work. It's a disposition of what we just learnt today. In a great God. And he he commended his faith in a sense, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in in, in the self same hour. And my Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, he's a rewarder of them that diligently what? Seek him. And faith seeks him like this. You say, does that mean uh, if I'm sick, I'm going to pray God and he will heal me? If it's according to God's will. But I believe the greatest sickness that every single person has is the sickness of sin. And God wants to definitely heal you from that. By his stripes, we are healed. If you come to him, he will no wise cast you out. You come with this disposition, broken and understand who he is, and you bow your head and heart, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You understand you're a sinner, and he's a great saviour, and he wants to save you. And he will in that self-same hour.
I remember 20 years ago, I called on the Lord, and it was instant. I'll never forget that day. God richly rewards and blesses those that seek and follow after him. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Blessed are they that which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The diligence is the key. God will not reward those who seek him in a half-hearted manner. God always required a whole-hearted faith. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, and when ye, and, and when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Romans 4, verse 20, talking about uh, Paul, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving God, uh, giving glory to God and being, look at this, fully persuaded that what he had what? Promised. He was able to also do what? Perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for what? Righteousness. There is faith. Taking God at his word. You take God at his word? You see yourself as unworthy? You know and understand the grace of God that have appeared unto all men? Do you, do, you, do you care for the word of God? Is it the authority behind? Do you call him Lord, Lord, and do not obey him? Or he's your Lord, he's your Savior, he's your Lord, and you follow him? I pray by God's grace you'll understand what this great faith looks like. Uh, I, want to, I want to be able to finish the end of the road by hearing, well done, my good and what? Faith. Knowing that I pleased him. And how do you please him? By faith. You live by faith. Don't forget this humble disposition and don't forget the Lord of your life. Don't forget it. Amen? Amen? Let's pray.